welcome to Board Gems. This is my regular video series with new videos on the 3rd, 13th, and 23rd of every month in which I cover older board game gems. Usually it's one game per video. Rough Cuts are games that I don't want to give full dedicated episodes to. It could be any number of reasons. Maybe I don't own the game so I can't do the teach. Maybe maybe I don't much care for the game, or maybe it's very like specific in terms of who I would rec for whom I would recommend the game. Don't assume that because a game is in a rough cut, that means that I think it's bad. I'm just going to do three games that I don't want to do full episodes on. The most recent video I did was on a game called Verflixt, which was designed by the very famous game design duo of Wolfgang Kramer and Michael Kiesling. They have made many, many games in the past, and most notably, to me anyway, most notably is their trilogy, what would be called the Mask Trilogy. I guess that name doesn't technically apply anymore with the new Super Meeple editions. You might call them the Pre-Columbian Trilogy. Anyway, Tikal, Cusco, Slash Java, and Mexico. And they're famous for their action point model. So... That was something that they were experimenting with a lot in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, um, where each player has a number of action points and different things that you can do have different costs and you decide how you want to spend your points. So I'm gonna spend two points to do this, three points to do that, whatever. So I'm gonna cover three other games which were not part of the trilogy, but feel like they share some of the same DNA. I'll cover them in chronological order, Torres, Sunken City, and Bison. Let's get started. Torres is not a hidden gem at all. Uh, it won Game of the Year in 2000, I think. It's actually contemporaneous to the trilogy, because Torres came out after the trilogy started with Tikal, but before the trilogy ended with Mexico. So... <laughs> So a lot of people also like to include Torres as part of that trilogy, and I can see why, because it definitely shared a lot of the same DNA. So the idea of Torres is you have a board as a simple grid, and on this grid you're going to be, you have your pawns, but you also have these starting castle blocks. And these castle blocks can grow, you can add more castle blocks as your action, but what you're trying to do is grow these castles and you're trying to have your pawns high up in the largest castles largest by width and also by height by the end of the round because there's three rounds and you score at the end of each round your pawns are going to score points based on how big the castle is and what level it's on it's pretty basic action point system. It's, you know, action points to move around the board, action points to put down blocks. Stepping up, higher up in the castle, you have to walk up like stairs. But if you want to go down a castle, it's basically one action to, as long as you're not on the top floor, if you're on like the second highest floor or lower, basically if there's a door like on the side of a castle block next to your pawn or near your pawn, then one action allows you to go into the door and run right through the entire castle and out, out any door you want for one action. <laughs> so you can actually make these kind of big turns. It's kind of funny when you have a pawn and you're trying to move it across the board and they're just like zipping through the castles to get there because just walking th in one door of a castle and out the other is only one action point. The meat of the game, you could say, are the cards. Now there's two different ways to play. There is... You can put all the cards together into kind of like a deck. And as an action, you can draw a card. And the card will give you a special ability. It might allow you to have extra action points on a particular turn. You can jump over other pawns. You can jump up and put a block directly underneath you <laughs> and then land on it. Just you move diagonally, right? Like you can, it just has a bunch of ways that you can break the rules basically. Without those cards, the game has no luck. So it can be, obviously, especially with two players, it can be very, very chess-like. It's the cards that vary the game up a bit. Now, here's the thing. There are two 
I guess there's more than two ways to play. Well, in the master rules, each player has access to all their cards. So they have a hand of cards and they're choosing maybe at most one to play per turn, right? But they can choose when to play them. Well, if you're playing with those master rules, even though you're playing with cards, because every player has all their cards right at the beginning of the game, it's again perfect information. But it's perfect information with a lot of flexibility. Uh, the games can develop quite differently because, like, if you're playing with the regular rules, the games can develop quite differently because you have different powers that you have different access to at different points of the game, right? So the game is going to develop differently. But in the master rules, it's, it's, again, perfect information. And I mention that because it's not for everyone. You know, the, the Mask trilogy is kind of famous for being really prone to analysis paralysis. Just analyzing the board. You know, uh, Mexica is the best of the three because it has very few action points. And you can bank some, so it actually seems... Like, you don't feel too stressed when you play it. At least that's my experience. Of all the ones I've played, keep in mind I have not played Java slash Cusco, but of the other ones I've played, Torres is by far, by far, the most analysis prone. And you're doing this, you're doing that, and you know you need to, oh wait, no, maybe I can do that better, and then you'll back up and try something else. And Look, I can say objectively that Torres is a good game, but it's really not a game for me. I don't much care for it. <laughs> I guess I could have covered it as a, as a board gem, because I can say objectively that it is a gem for certain people. But I just have a problem recommending it personally. You know, a lot of the games I cover for this channel are light, but thinky. And that's sort of an ideal. And Taurus is that. Taurus is actually quite light on rules and can be very, very thinky. So the fact that I don't much care for Taurus is probably worth sharing. Because just because you like other games that I recommend on this channel doesn't necessarily mean you will like Taurus. That's kind of similar to me to the Estates. They're not similar games at all, Taurus and the Estates. Other than, I guess you're adding blocks. It's kind of 3D. Anyway. It's not as brutal as the Estates, certainly. But it's one of those things where I have a certain type of game that I like. And sometimes a game goes very far in that direction. And I find that... It's actually gone a little too far for my liking. <laughs> Torres feels like the obvious end result of this design team's experimentation with using action points. Importantly, I don't know if this, this is still true, but I remember back in the day, Torres was the worst selling Spiel des Jahres winner. And Torres actually triggered a kind of reset of the award. Like, the jury has always awarded the game of the year to the game that is the best and to the most people. And this can often mean a game that is good for families, like families can enjoy it, but has an extra level for hobbyists, for people who re are really into games, they can kind of play it on another level. And in the late 90s, that balance really seems to have shifted toward the latter, toward the hobbyist. So it seems like they were rewarding a lot of games that hobbyists would love and also could be played by families. They weren't like crazy, crazy complicated or crazy, crazy, like deeply strategic. They were definitely more strategic than some of the lighter fare that most families play. But it's like, it's a gamer game that families can enjoy. And you saw that with El Grande. You saw that, in my opinion, with Tikal. You definitely saw that with Torres. So that late 90s to 2000 was a real, like that was a different direction. And that kind of peaked at Torres. And Torres sold, apparently, very badly. 
Every Spiel des Jahres winner sells well compared to other games, but compared to other Spiel des Jahres winners, Torres did not sell well. And I have to wonder if that's the reason for sort of the reset that the jury did. The game that won the Spiel des Jahres after Torres was Carcassonne. And ever since Carcassonne, it seems like the jury's been trying to strike the balance. They still do the same thing. Games that families can enjoy and hobbyists can enjoy with each other. And there's maybe a different sort of, maybe there's a different level that they can appreciate it on. In that balance, in the late 90s, they veered toward the hobby side. And after Torres, they reset. And so almost everything you saw after 2000 starting with Carcassonne. Then you saw stuff like Villa Paletti win and Alhambra and, and Ticket to Ride, of course. And these are all games that families can enjoy and one could argue are predominantly family games, but hobbyists can still enjoy them. It's not that Taurus is a bad game, but it kind of went, in my opinion, too far in a certain direction. And the jury acknowledged it and rewarded it, but I feel like the industry paid a, a little bit of a price uh, because of that. Um, I think a lot of families kind of lost in Germany, I think, a lot maybe lost a little bit of confidence in the Spiel des Jahres jury because, like, oh, Tours, that's the winner of this year. Okay, I'll get Tours. And then they play, and it's like, yeah, I mean, it works, but it's not, it's not that fun. It's way too thinky kind of thing, right? If you like the Mask Trilogy, if you like Tikal and Mexica and Java slash Kuzco, if you actually love all three of those games, you should definitely check out Torres because it's like the fourth game in that trilogy and was made in the middle of the trilogy. <laughs> and a lot of people consider it part of the trilogy unofficially. So if you like those games, you should check out Torres for sure. And I will say that Torres, I think, has aged quite well. Um, you know, sometimes I kind of rail against those cards with special powers kind of thing, or I allow you to break the rules or something. That's very common nowadays. I don't much care for that trend, but it's a very common trend nowadays. And Taurus has that. I think the players, modern hobbyists who don't play a lot of older games and only play and like the new stuff, I think they enjoy, you know, the hand of cards or the, you know, getting the special power cards and stuff. So I think Taurus ages really well and is objectively a good game. So what's the fifth game in the trilogy? If Torres is unofficially part of the trilogy, then what's the, what's the, is there another one that also could fit in that trilogy? There is, and it's called Sunken City. Sunken City was actually started as a design, was started before Tikal. The designers had an image, I think it was Wolfgang Kramer specifically, had this idea of the city kind of rising and falling. And they were trying to kind of make it work, and they couldn't quite make it work, at least the way they were picturing. But the development of that game eventually led to Tikal and the start of the Mask Trilogy. And then after the Mask Trilogy finishes, they actually returned and released Sunken City from an Italian company called Clementoni. Clementoni, they're an interesting company, and I have another game of theirs called um, uh, König Salomon's Schatzkammer. Same thing as Sunken City, massive box. Okay, so you have power grid size, right? So you have the old Mass Trilogy, right? Tikal, Java, Mexica, and the old, like, Rio Grande uh, Torres are in a bigger box in Power Grid. This is bigger again. <laughs> Clementoni, as a publisher, was never very friendly f for hobbyist game shelves. The best way to describe Sunken City is like a Mass Trilogy game, but visualized as a sort of race. So you have the player board, which is mostly just water, and each player has their own corner. And your goal is to go out into the water areas, a sunken city, raising roads and buildings. The buildings are very marvelous cubes, little 
they're not cardboard they're plastic they're they're quite charming they're really amazing amazing little pieces so players are raising roads and they're raising these buildings and each building has a different treasure in it now each player can get each treasure right so each building has one type of treasure and each player who can get to that building can pick up the treasure and at the end each treasure is worth points you're trying to collect high value treasures and as many treasures as possible players are spending action points to raise roads raise buildings and move their pawn along the roads to visit the buildings to pick up treasure they don't get to bank that treasure until they make it back to shore to their own corner there's also a poseidon pawn um, the poseidon pawn is something that you can also move and as the poseidon pawn moves it will actually start sinking things again and depending on the rule sets you use, um, there can be like waves, basically, not like literal like waves. That would make sense, actually, with the water theme. But I just mean like depending on the rule set you use, because there's two rule sets, um, there's the building up phase. And there can also be the sort of the sinking phase where the things drop back down again. And Poseidon as a pawn can be moved by the other players and can sink things that it moves on to. The game is a little bit of a push your luck game because you can carry as many treasures as you want, but if the building or road that your pawn is sitting on sinks before you get to back to your home base, your camp, all the treasures you're carrying are lost and you'd have to start over again. Can be if you push your luck hard and you're carrying tons of treasures, then losing them all in one go like that can be um could be potentially quite frustrating but at the same time you did that right you you were the one who pushed your luck there is um a little bit of card play because each player has a small hand of cards which gives you action points and it tells you how many action points you have to move your pawn versus raising things from the board or moving poseidon depending on the phase this is a common thing stefan dora's uh, yukata did this too where each player has an identical set of cards and on your turn you play one do what the card says and then on your next turn you have access to the rest of them but not that one and you play until all your cards are gone and then you get them all back so that's not dice it's still a little bit of chaos introduced by the other players because you don't know what cards they're going to play some move the pawn more some raise more stuff um, but there is still the randomness of dice rolls for poseidon the the regular rules as found in the box are a little bit weird because each player has basically their own territory and if poseidon is in their territory when they get to move them they get to move them extra spaces but they're also dice rolls there is actually an alternate uh, rule set that can be found on board game geek which is the advanced rules and the advanced rules are a little bit better they have a little bit of an ebb and flow no pun intended in that there's the raising phase and then at some point it triggers and then there's a sinking phase and poseidon is going around damaging everything and then it's the raising phase again right that rule set is better and does have more tension and is actually surprisingly i find easier to teach than the regular rules because regular rules you have to remember like oh if poseidon is in my territory then i get this many you know this much bonus movement to to him there is kind of a weird thing with the advanced rules in that all the buildings kind of start off the board and then you can choose which one to bring on the board but then that influences like where poseidon will will start um i haven't played it a ton which is another reason why i'm covering it as a rough cuts because from my few plays of it i really didn't see much value in the game sorry it's just not a game that you need to seek out honestly if you can pick it up for cheap great but it's a giant box be aware of that the components are nice but there's to, to me there just isn't enough there to justify it it the game works um, but with the regular rules there's very little tension uh, with the advanced rules it is a little bit better but still is it worth seeking out this older game because it provides like a special or better or unique or great experience and honestly no uh, the the best part of the game 
to me is the components of the buildings like <laughs> that that's that's marvelous but the rest of the game is pretty is pretty lackluster in my opinion and um, don't make me play this more <laughs> i don't want to play this game more it's not a bad game these these designers are great and they have made a good game i wonder because this game was published by clementoni and they don't publish like that's not a usual publisher clementoni like i i wonder if they shop that around to other publishers like Ravensburger, who originally published the uh, the mass trilogy and they and other publishers maybe tried it and they passed on it and they kept shopping it around they worked on it for many years they got it to a point where they were like i guess this is good enough right we could work another five years on this but let's not let's find a publisher and they found a publisher in clementoni but in terms of like other publishers that are probably more more famous and maybe could have published a Cromer and Kiesling game. Maybe they passed on this one. Did they go to Clementoni first, or did they try those other publishers and they passed on it? If they did, I can kind of get why. You know, if you stumble upon it inexpensively, I, you know, it's worth a try. Especially again, if you like these action point games, if you like the Mass Trilogy, if you like Torres, Sunken City is simpler, is more family friendly than than those. Um, out of those games this is the most kid friendly and the kids will have fun you know moving neptune or poseidon or whatever and you know sinking the spaces that you are on and having a big laugh or something and it, and it is easier to learn than some of those ones right like to call one the game of the year but it's a pretty thinky game sunken city isn't very um it is a very light family game um so it's a really kind of simplified, streamlined, action point game. Neat to try, but not one that I would suggest you, you try and seek out. The last game I'm covering is Bison. Now it's arguable whether this is an action point game or not, but bear with me. So this is again designed by Cromer and Kiesling, published I think 2006, more or less. Um, from Phalanx. Uh, Phalanx is, is or was a Dutch publisher. There is a new publisher called Phalanx. I'm not sure what the connection is to the old publisher. I know they have like a different logo and everything, so I'm not sure there's any connection or, or what the connection would be. The Phalanx had made Bison isn't really around anymore, but they had a series of these games. Um, the original Hey, That's My Fish was a Phalanx game. It was in that same uh, box size, very small box. And they were known in some ways for making games that were kind of, you know, they were kind of more gamery games or, or games that you could enjoy, um, you know, with hobbyists, with other hobbyists. There was a game there. It was a, not necessarily a very complicated game, but it was a thinky game potentially. But small box, not very expensive. I've always been curious about Bison, and I've had it in my collection uh, for a long time. Really hoping... Really hoping to, to try it. Finally, I was able to get the chance and uh, and share my experience with you. So check the photos. I'm not sure if I'm adding photos to this video, but you can always check Board Game Geek as well for the photos. See if the look is appealing to you, um, because the look is very divisive. I actually like the look, but it's not for everyone. It's definitely not art rich. It's a very kind of, um, you know, understated presentation, but it's got some wonderful little ideas. So it is technically a tile laying game, but the tiles are hexagons, but the sides alternate convex and concave. So the hexagons actually fit together, not in every way possible. You have to, you know, fit convex to concave. The corners all are water and they will generally have like a river that goes through it. And they will also have two other terrains, like mountains and plains. All three of these terrain types, so mountain and river and plains, correspond to a different food type. Generally, you're trying to get food. Now, you start with your tribes, your, your, your people, and they're cubes. I have no problem with cubes. 
Maybe you'd prefer Meeples. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Again, cheap, simple game. Don't worry about it. So you have cubes which represent your people, and it'll cost action points to move your people around and also to set up camp because you can convert your people into a tent in the case of mountains or 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 plains like a camp or it's a canoe for rivers but it's the same idea you're basically converting your people to these camps and these camps result in kind of a majority scoring there's values of one two three and four for your camps they have little diamonds on them you don't sum up the diamonds you just look at who has the most valuable camp and that person's going to get the, the big scoring. What do you get? You don't get points. You get food. You spend food to put more people on the board. So you want to get food. All, the only thing that matters in the end for endgame scoring is the final round. In that you total up all the food in your three types. You have these little tracks that you keep in front of you. And whoever has the most food gathered in that final round wins the game. The tiebreaker is the highest lowest. You may be familiar with that from Ingenious and Tigris and Euphrates, where you score on multiple fronts. You're scoring four or six different score tracks, and in the end it's the, the lowest one that matters, so you're trying to grow evenly. That is the case in Bison, but that's just the tiebreaker. In general, you're trying to get as much food as possible. And the game is very flexible in how you spend the food. Because when you bring people on the board, and you're spending food to do that, you can choose which food to spend. Like, that doesn't matter. So you can adjust it any way you like as you're spending the food. But of course, as you're getting the food, that depends on what's on the board. So obviously you want to camp out in the most valuable, the biggest planes and that. The tiles are random. There, there aren't that many. I forget how many there are, but there's a dozen or more tiles, maybe 18, something like that. And the tiles have different mixes of like different orientations of mountains and, and plains. If I remember correctly, each tile has always three food items. So it might have one bison in the plain, one fish in the river, one turkey in the mountain, or it could have three turkeys in the mountain some combination. Each player at the start of the round draws a tile as one of their actions, usually their first action for the round. They play the tile, they add it somewhere on the board, and then that's the tile that they add people to. When you're bringing in new people for the round, they're going on to the tile you just played. That makes it very easy when you bring people on the board if you're getting if you have lots of food immediately building a camp and if your tile has you know three of one food and nothing of another great put the camp there you're getting lots of food but if your tile has it spread out of one of each it's like this isn't that great it isn't as good to put a camp there you have to spend more actions kind of moving around to find the better spot. So it feels really lucky to get a tile that has like a lot of one type, right? Because you put that on the board, you bring your people in, immediately spend food to build like a really big valued camp, and now that section is obviously producing a lot, including the stuff that, that you just added to it. That's a bit weird. It would make more sense, like it would be more interesting to me if... You know, you got, oh, I got a tile and it had three turkeys on it, but I actually don't want turkeys that much because turkeys, I'm already getting lots of food in turkeys. I need to get food in the other kinds, right? That might be a little more interesting where you're trying to balance more the three different types of food. That's in the game, but it's really watered down because it's so easy to spend whichever food you want. So in the end, it's very easy to work with whatever you get. Whatever you get, if it's a lot of turkeys, great. You know what? I'm going to spend a lot of turkeys to do whatever I want. And then in the end, you know, I'm, I'm at the end of the round, I have a camp there. I'm going to be getting more turkeys. Great. You can make any food type work for your, for your purpose. So it feels like a missed opportunity. It almost feels like it was intended to be 
a more challenging game that somehow got that somehow got watered down maybe that's not the right word but some of the the sharp edges feel like they were kind of you know rubbed out it's not a very satisfying game as a result and it's not super short too um, my games of it have been probably an hour. This is a game that actually I would love to love. <laughs> um, I personally like the look of it. Um, your mileage may vary. I don't have a problem with the cubes. I think the whole flow of it is kind of is kind of interesting. It's a little disappointing that you bring in new people on the tile you just added. It would kind of make more, it would be more interesting to me if they started in the middle and you had to get to the good tiles, because then even if you're putting down a good tile, other players can try to reach that too and compete with it. And again, that doesn't really happen in this game. So it feels like there should be more tension, more excitement, and for whatever happened in the development process, um, I don't know, some some of the, the tension got got kind of rubbed out it the game has some some definitely has some good sides to it the flow is really simple so it, it's really kind of easy to get into it's easy to explain the costs of things feel a little bit wonky but the player aid helps great with that so even though i would forget mid game it's easy for me to just look at the player aid and go oh yeah right because some things will require like one of each type of food for example i love that it's in a small box um, it's also really not very expensive. I haven't checked recently, but this bison for a long, long time was crazy cheap and easy to find used, and I think probably still. So it, this game does not have much trade value, and you could very easily uh, find a copy used if you're if you're interested in it. It's worth checking out. I enjoyed it, but it felt like there was more game there that got lost. Maybe because it's in a small box, there was more stuff in the game that they left out to kind of keep the components simple. It is a very simple presentation and it is in a very small box. It's carcassonne size, but thinner. As it is, the game absolutely works, but there there just isn't enough to, to have you wanting to keep coming back to it again and again. Um, it definitely feels like uh, less than the sum of its parts uh, which is a shame because like i said it's super easy to find uh, if you're interested in it and you don't mind getting a used copy you can easily find a used copy of this probably for just a couple of bucks if you like Cromer and kiesling games you like kind of action games and you like games that have a very small footprint on your shelf uh, bison's worth checking out um, i like the game it's not necessarily one I, I would uh, give a strong recommendation for. That's pretty much it. I'll probably do a, another Rough Cuts episode uh, in the new year, in 2022. Thanks for watching, and Happy New Year! Remember, older games don't necessarily stop being good just because newer games come out. Take care.